When you go to Google and type in climate change is, you're going to see different results depending on where you live and the particular things that Google knows about your interests. That's not by accident, that's a design technique. What I want people to know is that everything they're doing online is being watched, is being tracked. Every single action you take is carefully monitored and recorded. We get rewarded by parts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. A whole generation is more anxious, more depressed. I always felt like fundamentally it was a force for good. I don't know if I feel that way anymore. If you want to control the population of your country, there has never been a tool as effective as Facebook. We built these things and we have a responsibility to change it. The intention could be, how do we make the world better? If technology creates mass chaos, loneliness, more polarization, more election hacking, more inability to focus on the real issues, we're toast. Today we're talking with the makers of feature documentary, The Social Dilemma, which examines the dark side of social media. Released on Netflix during 2020, The Social Dilemma earned seven Emmy nominations, including one for Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Special, as well as in the categories for Writing, Directing, Editing, Cinematography, Music, and Sound Editing. Joining us on Behind the Screen to talk about the documentary and its topic are director Jeff Orlowski, producer Larissa Rhodes, and editor Davis Kuhn. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. So thank you for joining us and congratulations on the documentary. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Let's start at the beginning. What prompted the idea to explore the topic? When we first uh, were exposed to Tristan, one of our main subjects in the film, um, I had known him through college, but uh, in 2017, I started to see him posting publicly about a critique of Google and a critique of the company that he worked at. Um, and it really opened up this exploration into wanting to investigate and see what exactly was going on. So I reached out to Larissa, um, our producer on the film, uh, soon spoke with Davis, our editor on the film, and, and the rest of our team to try to explore, you know, was there something here that could actually sh take shape and turn into a feature-length documentary? Um, and that, that kind of set us out on the, on the quest. And what year was that? 2017. That's when we first started thinking about it, and we started filming in January of 2018. Um, now, you also have a fictional story within the doc. Would you talk about the decision to create that and then balancing it with the interviews? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the start of the project, we we leaned very heavily into the interviews with our subject matter experts, the insiders, the engineers, the executives from these tech companies that we're also familiar with. And uh, working with Davis and our team very early on, we were reviewing all the footage and we knew we could easily have a wall to wall talking head film, um, which uh, <laughs> when we watched it and reviewed, it became very dense very quickly. Um, people explaining algorithms and, and just exactly how the code is working. And um, it was kind of hard to track everything for an hour and a half. Uh, I think the first pr cuts were probably, you know, two, two and a half hours as well, making it even more overwhelming. But um, the whole team, we kept talking about, like, how do we make it visual? How do we make it accessible? How do we make it easy for audiences to understand and to feel and to see what's going on and how this software and how this code is actually affecting us? And that's where in, in our creative conversations, um, it led to this idea of bringing to life the algorithms that are hiding on the other side of our screens. And um, that, that kind of led us down this path of exploring, okay, if we're going to bring the algorithms to life, let's see the family that's being affected by those algorithms. And everything sort of unfolded from there. And we were able to string all of those narrative concepts together, all based on the real world. The code actually is designed in the film. The algorithms are designed to replicate what we learned in the making of the film and just how these algorithms are actually functioned and designed. Um, and so that's that's what got us to the uh, the creative ideas that that ended up in the final version. Since you address everything from democracy to mental health, would you talk about those issues? Yeah, I think as we were you know thinking through and talking to all of the subjects in the film, 
we were recognizing that there were many different issues uh, and, and many different facets of this problem. And so uh, as each expert we would interview, we would hear a little bit more. Some experts were more concerned about algorithmic bias and the fact that you know algorithms are changing the way that we see our information ecosystem. Other experts, uh, psychologists were worried about the way that these technologies were affecting mental health. I think um, at each interview, we were really trying to understand how all of these pieces fit together. And there were many of the subjects that had written books about these issues um, or had been speaking and, uh, about these issues for many years. So for us, it was really trying to figure out how do we weave this story together as we were learning about the issues and how do we you know, to try to um, create a vision around uh, one big problem, which we were sort of seeing was the underlying problem of all of these issues coming together. Larissa, for those who haven't seen the documentary, would you elaborate on what you actually did learn about things like mental health? Sure. So I think in the making of this project uh, around mental health, we were speaking to a number of psychologists and psychiatrists, and many of them were concerned about the way that these technologies were co-opting the relationships of young people. Um, you know, when I went to school, uh, I was able to go home after school. And if there was a bully at school, that bully wouldn't follow me home. But now on my feed, I would be scrolling as a child and I would continue to see, you know, that type Type of behavior um, at home, in my bedroom, in my bathroom, wherever I was. Uh, so I think what we were recognizing is that these technologies are very powerful and they're changing the way that kids behave, interact, the way that they see themselves and the way they feel about their own self-worth. So for us, it was really about trying to think through, you know, how do we show uh, ourselves, parents and kids um, what, what these technologies are really doing and kind of hold up a mirror to society. And in the documentary, you even included some disturbing uh, numbers even about mental health and suicide rates. Yeah, um, and I, I think we would have to kind of go back because I think, you know, stats are currently changing and at every moment we're trying to get more and more information. But one of the subjects of the film, you know, speaks to the fact that we're running, running one of the largest psychological experiments on humankind uh, without a control group right now. And I think that for us is what's scary because the science isn't all out there. There's a lot of correlation, um, but not necessarily all of the causation. And so the scientists and the psychologists and the psychiatrists are seeing a lot of behavior that they feel are linked to, um, you know, these technologies uh, and the social media platforms. But I think there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to really bridge those connections and make it very clear, you know, how are these technologies really changing the way that kids live their lives? And in some cases, don't live their lives because suicide has been a rising cause of death for young people in this country and globally. Yeah, I have to say, uh, uh, as a parent, as a new parent, the, those uh, sections of the film were the, the most enlightening for me to work on in many ways. Um, you know, having graduated from high school as part of the last generation uh, to do so before the internet really took over the world. Um, uh, you know, I and my children were too young to use social media, but uh, watching how it affects kids who use it and kids who come of age. Um, with their phones in front of them and interacting with people through social media really um, kind of awakened a lot of concerns in me as a parent and uh, especially seeing the way my kids reacted to what little screen time they were getting as, as we made this film just reinforced everything that we were learning along the way. They're still too young for social media and, and I think that um, it's it's really difficult in this day and age to keep your film your kids away from screens, but uh, you know as far as I'm concerned, they're not going to have smartphones until they turn 18. <laughs> uh, I was waiting for you to say 21 or uh, 21 is probably not realistic. <laughs> not 18, but I think uh, at least until they get into high school, hopefully. I, you know I don't know. I, I feel like kids need to learn how to interact with each other face to face and in the real world before they uh, are exposed to social media. And to add to that too, um, we're seeing more and more companies that are creating technology designed for kids to be able to do the things that parents really want. Make a phone call, send a message, get picked up, 
but you don't need a smartphone that has every application in the world, that has every distraction in the world, that has all of these social media influences. And um, to add to some of the research that Larissa and Davis were talking about, um, we found there was a big difference in the research around screen time versus the research around social media usage. And the, the greatest harms that, um, that the researchers are seeing, uh, especially when it comes to mental health, is not associated with screen time necessarily. Um, it is associated with using those social media apps that have all those social dynamics and peer pressure dynamics built into them. So, um, you know, this is, uh, from my perspective, just a reminder for everyone, it, this is not a, an anti-technology conversation. You know, we as a team, we use technology all the time. We're using technology right now to have this conversation. And, and I think there are some technologies that are really designed for the users and for the public to engage in meaningful discourse. And then there are other technologies that are really designed to get our attention and to show us advertisements and to monetize an advertising model. I think that's the big fork in the road that we've seen in the making of this film. Would you also talk about its impact on democracy? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, when we first started working on this project, it was like, wait, you want to talk about social media? And then, wait, you're saying that social media is an existential threat and is a threat to democracy? It it literally was like years of a head scratcher of like, how how is it possible that me making a post about my lunch is going to affect, you know, the, the White House or what have you? Um, and I think this is this has become the harsh reality that we've been exposed to and that I think Washington has now recognized over the last year that these social media platforms and these technologies do have a direct line to how people think and see and understand the world and has a direct impact on, on real world events and politics. Um, one of our subjects, Shoshana Zuboff, she says that we can have a surveillance advertising state or we can have democracy, but we cannot have both. And that seems like a very aggressive mindset, but uh, I've come to agree with it at this point, that the way that these technology platforms are designed to, um, to see what we're interested in, to reinforce those things, to find the things that are going to keep us coming back and keep clicking and the things that are going to be best for the business model, those things, those patterns for each and every one of us tend to push us towards the extremes and push us towards polarization. This is the reason why I personally have stopped getting all news from social media. I've stopped using all social media, just period. But I certainly don't want to engage in conversations if, if you're reading your news from social media, because the algorithms are going to push you in a way that works for you and not based on and, and not optimized for the truth. And that political polarization that sort of has become the de facto output of this technology is a, is a very threat to our democracy. Um, we, we can't have our country operate um, in a functional way if people are going to be just listening to the things that most satisfy their whims and their their ideologies. Um, and certainly from the, the conversations that we've had with politicians, it's now been over 80, 85 politicians that our team has spoken to since the release of the film. And we are hearing more and more that politicians are extremely worried about this. They feel and they see the polarization on a daily basis. It's harder and harder to build consensus. It's harder and harder to work on anything in a bipartisan manner. Um, and that's really just the function of the way our information ecosystem, when you look at it as an entire ecosystem, how, how that ecosystem has been warped by these technology platforms. So the documentary premiered at Sundance in 2020. And then not long after the shutdown for COVID began, Davis, I know you revised the documentary after the Sundance premiere in order to reflect that. Would you elaborate? I think um, just after the film premiered at, at Sundance, uh, the news of the COVID virus started spreading um, in the media and we just quickly became uh, very serious. And, and at the same time, we saw the same patterns of the spreading of misinformation on social media uh, taking shape immediately and realized that this was uh, an incredible um, situation and, and a, a perfect example of the kinds of problems that this plat this, these platforms can solve. So um, I think uh, Netflix and, and Jeff and Larissa decided that we needed to incorporate this into our into our case a little bit, and and so we we made a few adjustments. We you know added a few comments here and there, and just um, 
trying to incorporate that uh, into the thread of the film. In the film, one of the studies that we cite is an MIT study um, that speaks to the fact that fake news on Twitter spreads six times faster than the truth. Um, and, you know, that's a specific uh, stat related to Twitter, but they see it and there have been more studies since then around mis in misinformation in general online. And I think for us, this was just a prime example um, that was really becoming offline harm, um, online harm that is then perpetrated into the offline real world. And it was a, a very clear example of how, you know, it's not just rumors and, you know, conspiracy theories spreading online. It is real um, people and people's lives at stake. So it was something that we felt compelled to include. And um, unfortunately, it has only continued to kind of spiral out of control. It's an ongoing story. So um, would you talk about how you made the documentary as this was unfolding? I mean, you were constantly getting new information. When we were uh, following the Sundance premiere, we were making some changes that we wanted to make, as Davis was saying. And, and as COVID was unfolding, our team was constantly trying to track all of the news and all of the headlines that were coming out and tying in the very explicit and clear misinformation that was, was happening virally. And, and misinformation that was having direct impacts on people's health and wellness and their lives, people dying from COVID misinformation. And we're now at a stage where, where this virus and, and misinformation around the vaccine has gotten to such a point where it, we're just going to continue having variants for a long time. Like there's no real end in sight if we don't get to herd immunity. And so we're, we're stuck in this new layer of COVID misinformation that is propagated through society because of misinformation around the vaccines now. And, and just one last thought to add here, going back to the political polarization themes that we were talking about, we've now gotten to a point where all of these things are overlapping and layering on top of each other, where we live in a world where wearing masks or not is a political polarizing concept. And we like, how, how do we solve these things? How do we actually have a functioning, healthy society based on science and facts and, and trustworthy, reliable information if we have machines that are just actively financially profiting off of disseminating falsehoods? Like that, that is the world that we live in now. Davis, in a prior conversation, you had said to me, documentaries are never finished. Would you, would you all elaborate on that topic? And do you have any plans or would you like to explore this topic further um, and maybe do another documentary on the topic? We're, we're still editing this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny that you, you ask about that because I, I think just as we struggled with, uh, briefly with the idea of whether to open the film back up and, and rework it, in order to address COVID, you know, I think I'm pretty sure I was on the phone with Jeff on January 6th, trying to decide whether or not we needed to do the same thing again and and work in some footage from the January 6th insurrection in, in the Capitol. Um, we, we ultimately didn't do that. But yeah, I think that, uh, you know, with any work of art or, or uh, a big project like this, uh, especially documentary films, it's you, you, you kind of, you're never really done working on them. You know, you just have, you get to a point where you have to pull the plug and, and finish it and get it out there in front of people. And yeah, I think that's what we decided to do with this film. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what's been great about it is that it has been a starting point for a lot of conversations and it's gotten people, uh, more people talking about it uh, and talking about social media and the way this business model works. And, and hopefully um, it will have a, have a real impact and, and people will continue to talk about it, whether we make a sequel or not, um, which I'm not ruling out, but uh, it's not really up to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, another thing I mentioned in an earlier interview, and as an editor I should know not to say things like that, but um, when Jeff first reached out to me about this project. Um, we had been working on films for years about climate change. And it's hard to think of a problem uh, that's scarier than climate change when you, when you think about uh, the future of humanity. But uh, I think what, what Jeff said to me that I'll never forget was that we're never going to solve climate change until we get this other problem sorted out. 
and, and that is that this social media problem is the problem beneath all of our other problems. And, and that's why it threatens democracy, and, and that's why, um, you know, we have to figure it out, and we have to figure out how to start seeing the world through the same eyes. Looking at recent events, if you were still working on this, are, are there topics that either you've been talking to new subjects about or things that you feel should be addressed? I think um, we, we spent so much time over the last year, you know, doing countless panels and Q&As and having conversations around the film. I think one of the interesting things that we've seen is that there is genuine bipartisan interest in moving towards solutions. And policymakers don't have all of the game, like the, the plans in line. They don't have the policy recommendations just mapped out yet because I think they're still trying to figure out what exactly can be done and how can it be done. Um, but we're in a very, very different place than we were a few years ago around what our policy members think about um, about these technology platforms. So I think that's just a very interesting and curious um, sort of footnote to where the film left off in terms of um, this conversation is sh is changing so rapidly in Washington, in the EU, in international parliaments. Um, and, and I think uh, tech regulation is going to be coming down soon um, just because so many people recognize it is absolutely needed. There's a, a analogy that Jeff has come up with that I, I really find apt, Jeff, and I don't know if you want to share it around just the speciation of, of thought and ideas because I think with our environmental work, it it really is a mirror uh, to how social media is really changing the way that we think. Jeff, do you want to share yeah, that? Yeah, I can absolutely jump into it. Um, you know, the way we, the, the way I've been thinking of these platforms, because each and every one of us is on our own individual unique feed. My Facebook would look different than your Facebook. Our, our Twitters, the four of us, all of our Twitters would look different, right? We are each effectively on our little, own little island and to invoke Darwin and speciation and evolution, the machine learning algorithms really are just amplified evolution. They learn and see what works, they modify, they make changes, they evolve based on random mutations, based on random information that the general public can put in, and it then evolves to each and every one of us. So it's as if we're on our own individual islands and all of our islands are now drifting farther and farther apart from each other. And, and the thing there that what we know from nature is that is how one species turns into two species, right? That's how all birds have evolved to be different birds that look different and act different, right? It is evolution over time. And it's the same thing where like a horse and a dog had a different evolutionary paths. That is where we're at with our ideas now. I, I look at this as speciation of thought that if you go onto these platforms and if you have a machine learning algorithm that is going to rapidly modify and evolve based on you individually, we all end up in places where we are, our ideas and our thoughts have become speciated and are no longer compatible with each other. That, that is what, what leads to the breakdown of democracy in my mind. That's what leads to the polarization. That's what leads to um, mistrust and, and lack of trusting all of this, uh, this whole system at this point, in that nobody has any sort of shared DNA to work off of. Like if, if there was somebody who had a very different political perspective than I do, and we started talking, it would take a long time to find just a place of consensus, a place of overlap. Like what do we even remotely agree on? And, and that's what's needed for a healthy democracy. That's what's needed for a healthy functioning society. And that, that's what I'm most worried about. The way that the, fundamentally, the way this technology is designed is a, it forces speciation of thought. Well, you didn't address it in your documentary. What are your thoughts on deep fakes, which obviously also is, you know, getting more advanced with machine learning? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We we didn't include it in the film because deep fakes felt explicitly like a bad actor working within the system. And we were trying to keep the critique to the problems of the system itself and the way the system is designed poorly. Um, and because of the way the system is designed poorly, things like deep fakes will just become more, they will become more and more problematic. Um, I am incredibly worried about deep fakes. Um, and the, the, 
the unfortunate part is I, I've spoken to some people in the tech industry who their mindset is that we will, as a, as a society, become so inundated with things like deep fakes and fake information constantly that we will not know how to trust anything. Like trust for anything will go out the window. Trust for science is gone. Trust for like for news is gone. Trust for anything moves to zero. And I, I just don't – I have no concept of how – we govern how we collaborate, how we work together as a species, if, if that's the case and if that's, just, that's the trajectory we're on. So um, it, it has me very worried, for sure. At the end of the documentary, you know, you encourage further conversation about this. What, what are you hearing from viewers? I think viewers are waking up to the reality that there's something wrong with this technology. And this is not how we want it to work. This is not how we want it to operate in our lives. And yet many viewers still feel stuck and addicted and torn in that, uh, especially during COVID, it, it feels like we are getting connection out of these platforms. Um, and and I, I say feels like that because I don't believe we are getting any connection from these platforms. We get connectivity. We get the ability to connect to others. And we get this sort of trivial false sense of understanding people and, and, and others um, where you don't get nuance. Like you can't, like this conversation that we're having right now, you could not have this conversation on Twitter, right? This conversation would be 140 characters, 140 characters. It would become like more extreme. No, but let me disagree and wait a second. And then it would just like unfollow, unfollow, block, like that's the end of the day. And that's how the technology has been designed in a way that does not foster meaningful conversation. Um, and I think that's really where I'm also excited about, where we are seeing um, new groups and new tech startups trying to make new technology to compete with these technologies. Whether we're talking about um, paid for search engines like Neva, where literally engineers and executives from Google said we're sick of this and they created their own company that is a search engine that is not based on the advertising business model. Or other platforms like Clubhouse that are, are, have committed to not using advertising and are designed for long form um, in-depth conversations. Um, I'm not saying that either of these platforms are perfect by any means, but they are a step in the right direction and a, the path that we need to go down where we need to separate the way we use the internet from this extractive and exploitative advertising surveillance business model. Like that, that, is, that will be the, the defining moment of this, this decade, of this generation, of this era, that we built technology that was so incredibly powerful that was bad for human civilization. Um, I, I put it on par with the fossil fuel industry at, at that level. Before we wrap, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you know, I, a lot of this conversation can be certainly overwhelming and exhausting. Um, it has been like that for our whole team for the last, you know, three plus years, um, spending so much time exploring this. But um, I, I do want to add um, that there is a lot of positivity and there's a lot of hope um, in terms of how we move forward. I see that hope both from politicians who are taking action and I see that hope from Gen Z who recognizes how these technology platforms are affecting them and don't want this to be the case and are trying to design and rebuild this technology. And I think ultimately the public is waking up to just like th this isn't how we want these technologies to be affecting our lives. And so I personally feel very optimistic. We are trying to raise awareness about these issues so that we can avoid the worst of the consequences. But we still need um, human action and we need action to happen at the political level to, to, solve, these, uh, to solve these issues and to um, design a better future for all of us. Thank you for taking the time to talk about the documentary and this important topic. Thank you so Thank much you. for having us. Thanks, Carolyn.